heads in prayer with me this morning. Our Heavenly Father, we celebrate Pentecost Sunday this morning as we remember that first time when you sent your Holy Spirit to empower, to comfort, to lead, and to guide. And Father, we just thank you that you do that still today. Father, help us to be people who listen to your Holy Spirit. We would allow your Holy Spirit to guide us, to lead us, and to walk with us. Father, we thank you for how you take care of us. I, I want to lift up those who are, are sick this morning. I just pray that you would bring healing there. Father, I pray that you would be with Randy. Uh, this is the second time that he's thought that there was a possibility of a transplant only to find out it was not going to happen. And so I just pray that you'd be with him, to just continue to sustain him. Uh, be with Robin as well, Father. Just give them comfort. Father, I also just pray that you'd be with uh, Adam in the same situation. And Father, I just pray that you would uh, bring healing to others that we know are dealing with illnesses. It's, I just pray that you would continue to bring healing to Jerry and just touch him. Father, I, I pray that you'd be with those who are dealing with other issues in life. I just pray that you would encourage and uplift I, I just think of Abby and Austin who began a new life together yesterday. And Father, I just pray that you would give them the patience and the wisdom and the understanding as, as they build a life together. Father, I also want to thank you for the tithes and the offerings we've received today. I just pray that you would bless the gift and the giver. Help us to understand that everything we have comes from you. And help us to steward wisely. Father, I also want to lift up our, our missionaries around the world, and we especially want to lift up the country of Honduras as we focus on that country this month. Father, I just pray that you would be with your church there, that you would encourage the pastors, and Father, that they would continue to strive to be obedient to you. Father, I thank you for your word, and I thank you for the opportunity we have to look at your word uh, each and every day. What a, uh, what a gift, and so many times we take it for granted. We realize that down through history, um, there's very few people who, who could actually um, pick up a book that contained your word and, and read it, especially in their own language. And so, Father... We thank you that we have that ability this morning, and I just pray that you would be with us as we study your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Before we get to the message, I just want to share a couple of announcements this morning. First of all, if you look out in the lobby, there is a tree that has uh, little uh, cards on there with uh, the picture of a, a child from our Wednesday night um, service and or kids program and they're not meeting during the summer and we don't want to forget them and so uh, we encourage you to pick up one of those cards you can just go ahead and take it off the tree and um, it has some information on there and just be lifting that kid up in prayer uh, during the summer and so we want to make sure we have some prayer partners for all of our kids so please 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 as you go out this uh, this morning pick up um, one of those and look at that tree there. Um, and, and if you don't pick them up, I'm just going to move the tree to the middle of the door. I, I found that works with a, a communion coming in, but we're just going to have to do that. And then next Sunday, um, at Memorial Day weekend, we're going to have a combined service at 10 a.m. And so you got to get up earlier. So, you know, you can do it. You can do it. So you can just change your routine a little bit, and we just want to encourage you to come and join us um, to, uh, next week at 10 a.m. And then finally, just a little heads up. Uh, during the summer, on Wednesdays, we're going to have um, Gains Connect, and we'll have different activities, but what it's just basically a, an opportunity for you to, 
to come and, and connect with uh, your Gaines family, especially when people are in and out a lot during the summer. Um, maybe they're not going to be here on the weekend or whatever, but we want to make sure that we have a, a space where we connect and we're working on those. So keep that in mind. And man, just, you know, we, it's just a, it's building relationships. And so um, we want to encourage you to uh, keep on the lookout for those events. All right, well, if you have your Bibles this morning, we're continuing in Matthew chapter 6. If you would turn to that, Matthew chapter 6, today we're going to talk about anxiety. And there were several pictures I thought I could use uh, for, for this. I picked this one. If you, I don't know if how well you can see it, but you can see there's a lion back there, and there's some antelope in front. And, and I, the front antelope, I don't know what he's thinking. The only thing I can imagine, he's thinking, I'm faster than all the rest of you. Because that, you know, that's what they say, right? All I have to do is outrun the, the, the slowest member of the pack there. But you can just see the anxiety. And if you've, you've probably seen that on TV, that very same thing. You've, you've seen how they go on high alert. And, you know, the tail goes up and the, and the ears prick up. And, man, they are on alert. And you can just sense that. Oh, no, this is not good. Well, we're going to talk about anxiety today. That's what's next in the passage we're working through. And it's important. It's something that we really struggle with. There's a lot of anxiety in our country today. And, and the numbers are, are, are um, pretty impressive as far as how much they uh, say that uh, anxiety affects people. And it's a big thing. It's a big deal. And so it's important that we uh, discuss it. Also, it was a big thing in Jesus' time. Now, I want you to remember this whole passage is still what we call the Sermon on the Mount. So Jesus is sitting on a mountainside and he's looking at all these people and guess what? All kinds of anxiety. They have it all over the place. I mean, it's tough, you know, the, you're under Roman occupation and, you know, things don't go well. And so there's a lot of anxiety out there. And so it's the same thing back then. And so Jesus addresses it there. And I also think it's interesting that he addresses it right after he talks about how we are to deal with possessions. If you remember last week, we talked about uh, how what Jesus says about our possessions, and then right after possessions, he starts talking about anxiety. If you remember last week, I, said, I, I used the illustration of a closed fist. And I said, you know, a lot of times, this is how we approach our possessions. Instead of having our possessions in an open hand where we can enjoy them and others can enjoy them, and, and if they get ripped out of our hand, it doesn't hurt so bad. Instead, we, we do this and we hold it tight. And, and, and we can't enjoy it near as much. Nobody else can enjoy it because we've got it, you know, pretty well locked up. And not only that, but when it gets ripped out of our hand, it hurts. So what I want you to do this morning is I want you to go ahead and make a fist. Go ahead. I know that you're thinking, I'm not going to do that, Tom. You're, you're trying to manipulate me, but go ahead and do it anyway. Make a fist. Don't make me come around and check. What I want you to do now is imagine in your own mind your most valuable possession. And it's in there. No, Phil, you can't say it's Liz. <laughs> your most value possess valuable possession, and you've got it. Now just go ahead and open your hand. You're letting go of that valuable possession. You know that uneasy, that kind of queasy feeling you're feeling right now? That's anxiety. So we're going to talk about that today. Well, let's first of all just read the passage. Matthew 6, beginning with verse 25. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear, is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or weep 
or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor were dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Now, before we really get into the meat of, of this teaching here, I want us to understand something. The, this uh, translation said, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. And um, other translations, if you have a King James, for example, it'll, it will say, take no thought. And what some people have thought that to be and kind of uh, gotten from that is they don't have to work anymore. Now, it's interesting, it, it brings up birds here in a second, and, and it says they do not sow, they do not reap, and they do not store in barns. But I just want to say that birds still work a lot at eating, as long as they are someplace else other than my um, bird feeders. And there they waste it. But anyway, what I'm saying is this is not license to be lazy. A good work ethic is biblical. And the Bible has a lot to say about that, having a good work ethic. So don't read this to say, I don't have to work. God's just going to just, wow, look what he put on me today. It's not saying that at all. But we have to understand um, that there is a good work ethic that we have to have. The, the rabbis, they had a couple of uh, interesting sayings that I, I like. The first one is, teach your son a trade or you will be teaching him to steal. And it didn't matter how uh, intelligent they might be, how they might, you know, oh man, this, this kid, he is, he is headed for a doctorate. He's he just a brainiac you know, he'll figure it out. We don't have to worry. No, everybody learned to trade. In fact, in the Bible, we read the Apostle Paul. He's um, an incredible scholar. He was, incre he was an incredible scholar even to people of his day. They, they, he even, you know, he's talking about um, how he was advancing in Judaism beyond all his peers. But even he, we read in the Bible, had a trade. He was a tent maker. And so it was important that they had this uh, ability to work. But this is another um, rabbinic teaching. And it says, he who has a loaf in his basket and, and who says, what will I eat tomorrow? Is a man of little faith. And so I just want us to understand as we look at this passage, there is that tension there. It's, it is important that we work. It is important that we have that ethic. But at the same time, we are people of faith, and we need to make sure that we keep that uh, intention. Okay, I want to look at three things out of this passage then about how we deal with anxiety. And it's one thing that we need to know, and then two things that I think we need to do. So, the first thing is what we need to know and what we need to get straight, really, and that is God's character. And a lot of it is stuff that you've heard before. And you, you know this, but it's, it's what I'm saying is we have to make sure we get it and we just put it in our brains and we just 
keep it, and it has to do with the goodness of God. And if I just said to you, God is good, you say, okay, yeah. But I'm saying, no, he really is good. And we have to understand that. He values us. It talks in here, it says he values us much more than a sparrow, and he takes really good care of a sparrow. Can you imagine Jesus is sitting on this mountainside, overlooking the Sea of Galilee, most likely. And you can just imagine there's these updrafts and these birds cruising around in, this, in these updrafts, and, and Jesus probably sees them, and, and you know, he's noticing them, and, and he's probably pointing them out and telling the people, look at them. They're just going through life. They, they look free. What do we say? We want to be free as a bird. And he, and, and he says, look, God takes care of those and you are so much more valuable. And then he talks about the flowers. And I want you to notice something about the flowers. He doesn't say that they're adequately uh, dressed or adequ adequately clothed. No, he says more than that. Far more than that. In fact, Solomon is nothing compared to these flowers. Now, let me just let you know that Solomon, he was a king, and he was the, the, the very height of well-dressed. I don't know if you noticed, but a few months ago, there was a, a discovery in, in Israel in an archaeological site. They found some some cloth, some material, some threads, and it had a dye on it. And the dye, they said, did not come from that local area. It came from very far away. And the reason that it was a significant finding, it showed that this material got there from a long ways away, and the only place that that would happen, or the only way that would happen, is if royalty was involved, and they said it was probably from King Solomon's era, because Solomon is king, and there's people bringing stuff to him, because, to, man, they want to make sure that they are in Solomon's favor, and, or if he wanted to, he would just send for the very best. And so Solomon, to the people that Jesus is talking to, would have been the best dressed. And what Jesus says here is, is the flowers, they, they look even better than Solomon. And so what he's saying is God's character is to bless you far beyond just making do. Far beyond just getting by. Now, I'm not going to go crazy here and, and say, you know, that uh, he's just going to give you tons of money or, you know, that, the, the health and wealth stuff. Because I believe that, it, you know, we struggle. And it's important that we struggle, actually. I think it helps us in, in, in so many ways. But we see that Jesus, or what Jesus is pointing out is that God has been faithful and he takes care of the birds, he takes care of the, uh, the flowers, he, he takes care of the grass, and if he takes care of that, and if he's faithful in that, how much more is he gonna take care of you and is he gonna be faithful to you? It's interesting how we go through life and how we view life, how it affects that journey. And some people go through life with a lot of anxiety and they're scared. I'll, I'll, uh, here's an example. Kim and I went to visit our daughter in Chicago in the last few days. And as we were going, we were going through the toll booth. We have one of those easy pass things, but I left it in the wrong car. But when we were coming out of a toll, toll booth, Kim says, I just hate this. Because there's like six lanes, or eight lanes sometimes, and, it, and it's coming down to two, and it's just chaos, and there's cars everywhere. And it just, just, ah. And I said, Kim, that's the best part. We're all in the starting gate here, and we got to get down to two lanes, and we got to beat everybody. And some of them are, you know, they're starting ahead of us. We got to catch them. 
And when we got our car, she said, she insisted that it be a stick shift. And the only reason you buy a stick shift is so you can redline that thing. <laughs> and so it makes all the difference in the world. You pay your toll, that gate goes up, and you can be going full of anxiety. Or you can say, let's go and make sure you get there first. And you know, there's so many examples of that, you know, in life. And it all depends on our attitude and how we are approaching those things, what kind of people of faith we are. I, there's other examples, and I'm not saying it's easy. We read in the Bible the story of Jesus and the disciples on a boat, and a storm kept, comes up, and, and Jesus is sleeping in the bow of the boat. Remember that? The, the, the disciples, you know, they were fishermen on that very lake. So what do you think? They knew all about storms. They knew probably how fast they could develop. They probably knew, man, if it's coming from that direction, it's going to be bad. They knew the danger that you could be in in their type of boat. They knew all that, and they're scared to death. And then they get to the point where they wake up Jesus and he says, ye of little faith. Can you imagine how much fun the disciples could have had in that storm if they had a lot of faith? Oh, here comes a big one. This is going to be cool. We're going to be surfing down this one. Let's see how fast we can go now. But instead they're terrified. So the first thing we need to know is God's character. He loves you, he values you, and he is faithful to take care of you. But let's look at some of the things that we need to do. And the first thing is we need to make God our priority. It says, in verse 33, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. You know, seeking other things other than his kingdom and his righteousness gets us in all kinds of trouble. And I want you to listen carefully because we can chase after in life, we can seek things in life that are really good. But if they're not a part of God's kingdom, if they're not part of his righteousness, if, it's not, if we're not being obedient to him, even if it might be a good thing, we're going to find ourselves in a lot of trouble. Maybe he has somebody else for that. We need to be very careful that we are obedient to what God is calling us to do and what he's calling uh, us to be. I want to read Philippians 4, 6, and 7. My daughter struggles with anxiety. And I, 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 I was going to fix it for her. And so I said, here, read this. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. There you go. Just do that. I mean, you'll be, you'll be, you'll be fixed. It'll be perfect. Guess what? That doesn't work a bit. Because what this is talking about is how we live. It's a lifestyle. It's not just information. Oh, that, okay, well then, that, sorry. It's important that we live this way. Well, let's just look at that. It talks about prayer. We, we don't object to prayer. And we will pray. But how is your prayer life really? It says, 
by prayer and petition with thanksgiving. And yeah, we'll say thanks, God. But do we live grateful lives? Is that how we go through life? Just grateful? Just really thankful? We're thankful for what we have. We're thankful for that meal. And I, I tell you, that's why when, when, like, I pray in our family, we pray for our meals. Probably most of you do too. But you know what? I pray for the meal. Because have you ever noticed how we've kind of developed that over the years? And your God, thank you for this food. And then we go on to about six other things. And there's nothing wrong with that. But we almost lose sight of the fact that this food that we're eating, this is a gift. And I know you worked for it and you paid for it and you cooked it and you did work. But all of that, the fact that you are able to earn money, it's all a gift. And sometimes we need to stop and just focus on those simple things. Say, this is a gift. So with thankfulness, present your request to God. It says, we're to ask God uh, there's a, another passage in James 4, verses 2 and 3, and it says this. It says, you desire, but you do not have, so you kill. Well, that's pretty drastic there. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. Maybe, maybe you can relate to that. You do not have because you do not ask God. And when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. That you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You see, it's back to this idea of seeking his kingdom and his righteousness. That needs to be our priority. So that's one thing. A lifestyle that makes God our priority. The second thing that you need to do to live anxious free is take one day at a time. This is what it says, verse 34. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. If you're, uh, if you're someone who's a fixer, you know, someone tells you, uh, and, and by the way, a lot of men happen to be fixers, and your wife will tell you something, and you fix it for them, I, I don't know why that's such a hard thing. I mean, well, here you go, honey, just do this and that and that. And they say, well, I didn't need you to tell me that. I just wanted you to listen. Fixers have a hard time understanding that anxiety is, is, is not about that. And there's a reason that Jesus puts us in there. Because when we do that, we do that, we, we think about tomorrow, the next week, the next month, what's going to happen next year. And that's where, if you think about it, almost anything that you're anxious about has to do with thinking of what's going to happen tomorrow or next week, next month, or next year. And we have to learn sometimes to live in the present and focus on the present. When we, Kim and I hadn't been married very long, uh, I had to get a yellow fever shot, and um, I, I know, you know, I can pinch my arm. Shot's going to hurt more, uh, less than that. I know that. But I have this really strange thing that a needle is not supposed to approach my body and especially puncture it. I just don't do well with that. It shouldn't happen. So in other words, I'm a big wuss when it comes to getting shots. 
And the only place I could get this shot was uh, at the health department. It was yellow fever, and, and uh, we were in Florida at the time, so we were downtown Orlando. Now, it was, it was in the win- winter time, and guess what happens? Guess who else is at the health department in Florida? A bunch of old people from Michigan. They're all there. They're getting flu shots. But anyway, we, we go down there, and Kim is with me, and there were three lines. And I, that, that's creating anxiety because I always pick the wrong line. You know, I can pick the shortest line at the grocery store and guarantee there'll be a price check. You know, it, 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 that's just the way it is. So I'm here watching, and there's one girl in the, that's given the shots in this line, and man, she's right out of nursing school. She's young. There's not a chance that she's going to be giving me my shot. And there was another one that she should have retired like 15, 20 years before. And she's kind of shaky now. And no, she's not giving my, but I had one. It, it, man, she was like, right, she looked experienced. And so I'm, and I'm focusing. And Kim's trying to talk to me. And I finally said, Kim, you have to stop talking to me. And she goes, why? I said, because I have to get a shot here. And this takes a lot of concentration. And we slowly made our way step by step by step till we got there. And you know, when, you're, when you deal with somebody, especially if somebody has an anxiety attack, what you have to do is, because you know what you want to do? It'll be okay. Tomorrow this will all be over. That doesn't work. It's just, I'm here. And I'm just going to take this moment right now one day at a time. That's living in the present. And we happen to be people that aren't very good at living in the present. And if we want to be people who uh, handle uh, those things that cause anxiety well, we have to be people who live in the present and not worry about tomorrow, next week, next month, and so on. Corey Tenboom had this quote, worry does not empty tomorrow of sorrows, it empties today of strength. And I thought, yeah, that's so true. We lose strength for today because we're worrying about tomorrow. So let me just wrap it up. The cure is a lifestyle that reflects an intentional trust in God. It seeks his kingdom, and it takes one day at a time. I had a friend when I was a teenager, and I went over to his house, and he warned me. He said, now, I got, my mom, she has her ways, so just, just go with it. I had no idea what he was talking about. I opened the front door, and there was this beautiful hallway, this beautiful carpet, completely covered in plastic. I was told, stay on the plastic. I hope I'm not stepping on anybody's toes right now. (laughs) But I walked in, and I went into their uh, living room, and there was a couch that I was invited to sit on, completely covered in plastic. I'm like, this is not comfortable. I don't know if you've ever sat on a uh, plastic covered couch. And I didn't, I, this was new to me. I didn't understand. I didn't know if they'd just gotten it and they hadn't unwrapped it yet or what. But, but come to find out, his mom, and I just thought to myself, you know, in 30 years, she's going to get rid of this couch. It's going to be at a garage sale. And people are going to say, this is brand new. And somebody's going to enjoy that couch, but it's not going to be them because they're sitting on plastic. And, you know, we do that with our lives. And we live plastic lives. And what I'm saying is let's be different. Let's go ahead. Go ahead. I didn't 
family member in church this morning, so I, I won't talk. So, uh, Jan, I'm talking about my Uncle Phil. <laughs> you know what I like about Uncle Phil? You can walk right into his house and walk right over his carpets because he said that's what it's there for. And when it gets messed up, we'll just change it. That's why we need to live. And let's not try and cover everything in plastic. I think a lot of people are enslaved by anxiety. And they go through life, it's tough, every single day. And I know it's not easy. That's why I said it's not a matter of just, you know, telling you this stuff and you're going to walk out of here and say, I'm fixed. I know that doesn't happen. But what I want to say is there is freedom. We can find that. So I want to just test your anxiety now. So if you take this little communion cup and try and get that plastic off. But as we prepare for communion, I want you to just think back. Jesus is with his disciples, and this is an invitation. And this is still an invitation to you and I. This is an invitation to come. Come join my family. And so maybe today, as you take communion, I want to think, you know, I'm worrying about way too many things, and I'm letting those things enslave me. And I want to live differently. I want to live the way God wants me to live. And so as you take it this morning, I I want to encourage you, maybe that's the direction you want to move. Would you please bow your heads as I pray for this? Heavenly Father, we just pray your blessing upon these elements. Father, I just pray that you would speak to our hearts that you are inviting us, that you value us, and you promise freedom to us. That ability to soar like a sparrow. That ability to enjoy the majesty of a flower. Because you care, you are faithful. So bless these elements as we take them this morning. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We read that Jesus was with the disciples in the upper room and he took the bread and he broke it and he passed and he said, this represents my body broken for you. Take and eat. then it says he took the cup and he said this represents my blood shed for your sins take and drink oh God you are so good you are good to us and Father, we, we, just, we, we have this tendency to go through life just full of our fear, our anxiety, our concern, our worry. We name it all sorts of things. But Father, help us to live free. Help us to live in your love. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.